Thank you, Jersey, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming early. And um, our course will begin with um, just remind you of the retinal interface anatomy, which is the junction between the posterior hyaloid and the internal limiting membrane. The posterior cortical vitreous is made of collagen type 2, and the internal limiting membrane is made of collagen type 4, and this is important um, regarding the staining properties. This is just an enumeration of the vitreoretinal interface disorders. We have the vitromacular traction syndrome, idiopathic macular holes, lamellar macular hole, apimacular membrane, myopic traction, maculopathy is also a vitreoretinal interface disorder. And we have also vitreoretinal interface disorders in proliferative diabetic retinopathy and associated with AMD. And then there is a group of vitreoretinal interface disorder that you cannot classify to any of the above. So what is the pathogenesis? There is a great paper made by um, Seabag describing the pathogenesis of the vitreoretinal interface disorders. And if we um, look what makes the vitreous separate from, separates from the internal limiting membrane, we found that there are two events occurring with age. The first is gel liquefaction, that is changes in the macromolecular structure of the vitreous gel. And the second event is adhesence between the posterior vitreous uh, surface and the internal limiting membrane. When these two events occur simultaneously, then we have a normal, complete PVD. But when one, um, especially the gel liquefaction, exceeds the vitreoretinal dehiscence, we have an anomalous PVD or PVDA, or we have an incomplete PVD or a vitreous hesis. So the anomalous PVD can occur anywhere uh, in the fundus. In the retinal periphery, it leads to formation of retinal breaks and retinal detachment. On the macula, it leads to the famous vitreoretinal interface disorders, and if it uh, uh, there is no detachment of the vitreous on the optic disc, we have a vitreopapillary uh, traction. We start by the um, AP retinal membrane, and I would like to uh, discuss it from the aspect of whether you are going to peel the internal limiting membrane or peel the epimacular membrane. So let us pass through what is the classification of epiretinal membranes, and our concern is the simple or idiopathic epimacular membrane, and here the predominant histological features is ILM and the laminocytes. The etiology occurs with PVD, and it is due to minute um, ruptures in the internal limiting membrane and lamination, um, uh, migration of the laminocytes. Other um, Epimacular membranes occurring due to tissue repair, as in uh, PVR and the trauma cases, or neovascular, as in um, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy and other proliferative retinopathies. Um, should we peel the um, internal limiting membrane with the epimacular membrane? Let us discuss this from two aspects the pathologic evidence and the clinical or surgical evidence. Well, what is the pathology or sequence of events uh, behind the formation of epimacular membranes? First, there is um, PVD occurring in a high percentage of cases with epimacular membrane, and almost 75 to 93 percent. And this leads to sub, uh, minute, minute or subtle ILM breaks. Through these breaks, there is migration of accessory glial cells, um, the, the so-called laminocytes, and these laminocytes proliferate on the um, vitreal surface of the internal limiting membrane, forming a uh, one layer, as seen in the picture, um, and then there is um, hyperconvolution of the internal limiting membrane, novel basement membrane formation, and even duplication of the internal limiting membrane. The OCT 
um, these two OCTs shows, uh, show PVD with um, epimacular membrane formation, and the, the other one shows hyperconvolution of the internal limiting membrane. Then I'm going to discuss what happens when you inject a dye on the surface of a retina containing an epimacular membrane. And uh, this is the picture seen intraoperatively um, if you inject brilliant blue or brilliant blue gene. There is areas which are stained and other areas that are not stained. So it is a heterogeneous staining. What does it mean? If you look into this um, picture of the fundus, so there is a circular defect around the macular area. And if you look into areas where there is a stain, the ILM is stained and a thin layer of epimacular membrane, but the absence of a stain means that there is a dense epimacular membrane because the ILM um, takes the stain much more than the epimacular membrane. And around or in the paravascular areas, there is no stain. And this means that in these areas, there is um, no or a weak attachment of the internal limiting membrane to the uh, vessels. Let's have a look on this case. This is the case with the circular defect around the fovea. And sometimes there is herniation of the um, retinal tissue through this defect. In these cases, you may start the peeling by elevating the epimacular membrane, starting from this circular defect, because in this area, there is um, no um, ILM, and there is a defect in the epimacular membrane, and there is an edge. So we start by elevating the um, epimacular membrane, and then once elevated, it is peeled. And please notice areas of faint stain and areas of dense stain or unstained. You find that the areas of unstained, the membrane is dense. Is dense, but in other areas, the membrane is thin. And um, I don't think it is very important to know from the OCT where to start the peeling, because you, this has, been, has to be decided intraoperatively. So this is, these are areas of thick membranes, which with no stain, and thin areas where the ILM um, is um, stained. And this is continued until you remove the whole epimacular membrane. This is another case. The, there is an absent stain here in the paravascular areas and absent stain in, the other, in other areas, denoting that these are thick membranes. Now I will inject the first uh, brilliant blue and let us see what is going on. There is heterogeneous stain and it is... Um, peeled using, this is the uh, ILM forceps, and you can see that the thick membranes, there is no stain in the area of thick where the membrane is thick, but in areas where the membrane is thin, there is a stain, and this is the um, cause of the heterogeneous uh, stain. So now you remove the epimacular membrane, and you uh, think that you have also removed the internal limiting membrane. But if you stain again, you find that many areas are still covered by the internal limiting membrane. Whether it is important to remove the, this part of the internal limiting membrane or not is still controversial. But in my opinion, the ILM is a scaffold for proliferation and may this, and this may lead to recurrence of epimacular membrane formation. Let's have a look on this case here. There is a retracted ILM edge due to epiretinal membrane contraction. So when the epiretinal membrane contracts, it may drag the um, 
the internal limiting membrane, and there are areas of absent stain. This is the first stain, and And you can see, as um, in the previous cases, um, areas of thick membranes with no stain and areas of thin membranes. Again, when you inject again trimsin alone, you find that there are still ILM not removed. So I consider the second stain um, important because it reveals the remaining internal limiting membrane. This is an interesting case. This is a retracted, a scrolled ILM edge due to epiretinal membrane contraction. And there are still absent stains. This is the first stain. This is a thick membrane, and it is a contracted AP macular membrane. And you can see that this part is um, elevated and is thick. And actually there was no stain here because the epimacular membrane is thick and the internal limiting membrane was not stained. And the removal of the epimacular membrane does not mean you have removed the underlying ILM. So if you inject again the dye, you find other areas of ILM. Now it is better stained because you have removed the thick part of the epimacular membrane. And you have to complete the peeling um, till the removal. This is no stain. It is the, still there is an epimacular membrane and the internal limiting membrane, they um, came together. And then only in this way you can be sure that you have removed both the epiretinal membrane and the internal limiting membrane. In this case, the epiretinal membrane is adherent to the posterior hyaloid. And this is not common finding of a still adherent posterior hyaloid or no PVD. This is a part of the EP macular membrane, which is adherent to the back of the um, posterior hyaloid, and still it is adherent to the fovea, and it is also adherent to the um, lower temporal arcade. Now, you should not make more traction than this, and you have to trim this with the cutter, and then you complete the peeling of the posterior hyaloid. So this adherent posterior hyaloid is only present in the minority of cases. And then you re-inject the dye, you find that the ILM is not removed and it is intact and you have to remove the ILM, which is re revealed only by the second stain in order to prevent recurrence of the epimacular membrane formation. Here, the epimacular membrane was removed without stain because it was obvious. And it, is, uh, it was a, a, a thick epimacular membrane. This is, the, by the way, a 25-gauge surgery, which I prefer in most of the uh, vitretinal interface disorders. Now you have removed the thick part of the epimacular membrane, and if you restain, then there is still a large area of the internal limiting membrane which is not removed, and it has to be removed, as we said before. Again, this is the case of epimacular membrane. 
that was peeled without stain because it is a thick membrane, and it also it is an extensive membrane. It extends beyond the arcades on the temporal side. And again, you may think that you have removed the, uh, both the aperitinal membrane and the ILM. So when you inject again, there is plenty of ILM still present and you have to under uh, remove this part. Let's have a look on this fundus picture and the OCT. In this part, there is a contracted epimacular membrane that break the internal limiting membrane, and the internal limiting membrane um, became retracted and scrolled. And in this area, between the disc and the epimacular membrane, there is no ILM, what we call ILM rip, and the epimacular membrane is contracted, and this is the result, post-operative result. This is, again, a case of contracted epimacular membrane. The ILM has been um, ripped, and if we look at the surgery, this is a thick epimacular membrane. and so thick and contracted that it folded the retina. Again, the second stain revealed the absence of epimacular membrane above the fovium, and the only part of the internal limiting membrane is below the fovium. This means that there is, this is the preoperative and the postoperative picture and um, I think this is the last case of a severely contracted epimacular membrane, and you can see that the retinal tissue is um, herniating through the defect of the um, epimacular membrane. This is the fundus picture. And um, this is the part of the retina that herniates through the defect, as you will see. So, over this herniated part, there is no ILM, and it is only the epimacular membrane, which has underwent a centrifugal contraction. And if you stain again, you will discover the presence of ILM outside the posterior pole. But in the posterior pole, here there is no ILM, because it has been ripped, and you have to continue peeling the ILM um, because it, there may be a faint membrane underneath. And this is the post-operative picture with um, um, attempts to restore the normal uh, configuration of the, um, of the fovium. So in conclusion, ILM peeling removes the laminocytes, hyalocytes, fibroblasts, a well-known source for cell proliferation and epiretinal membrane uh, recurrence. Both ILM and epiretinal membrane is peeled together in areas of negative stain, that is the thick part of the membrane. In other parts where the membrane, where areas of positive stain, ILM is still present and usually has a thin layer of an overlying membrane Incomplete peeling of the ILM is associated with high risk of epiretinal membrane recurrence and double staining and even, even triple staining may, may be needed to um, remove completely the epiretinal membrane and the uh, underlying ILM. So in conclusion, in epiretinal membrane surgery, ILM peeling is associated with um, better anatomical and visual outcome and in my cases, zero recurrence. Thank you. <clears throat>